My name is Nandita Garud and I'm a new faculty member here at UCLA in the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department. And this is my first CGSI, so I'm really excited to present to you work that is very exciting to me, which is on population genetics and the microbiome. And uh, today what I'm going to do is give you an overview of what I think is important in the field, but also, of course, heavily drawing upon some of my own work while giving you an impression of some of the concurrent work going on in the field. So we've learned a lot about evolution in, of bacteria in simple communities in vitro. For example, uh, Lenski et al. have this very famous experiment where they were evolving E. coli in test tubes for tens of thousands of generations. And what they saw, and other people studying experimental evolution saw, is that evolution can be really rapid and repeatable. Now the question is, how does this picture of rapid evolution translate to something like the human gut microbiome, which is a very, very different and complex system? Some of the things that are really different about studying evolution in the microbiome versus the, a test tube is, well, you have a lot of rapid environmental fluctuations and a lot of spatial structure. And these are not necessarily easily uh, uh, modeled in a test tube. But more importantly, we also have a very complex community of microbes in us. We have bacteria, fungi, archaea, and viruses all interacting with each other. And that can actually really have a great impact on the evolutionary dynamics inside of us. Whereas in a test tube, we're usually studying simple communities. In fact, if evolution is actually rapid inside of us, this rapid evolution could have an impact on the ecology inside of us. After all, it's been commonly believed that ecology should act on short timescales and evolution on long timescales. But if the two are acting on similar timescales, how do they intersect and impact each other? So there is reason to believe that the microbiome primarily actually might respond to its environment through ecological responses. And in fact, much of the work on the microbiome so far has been on studying species fluctuations over time. And so many, and, and in fact, this is very important, species fluctuations have been commonly associated with many diseases like obesity, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's, and more. But there are other ways by which the mi microbiome can respond to its environment. For example, there could be invasions of better fit strains, or there could actually be evolution whereby a resident strain acquires a new de novo mutation or takes up standing variation from the broader population, and then that mutation sweeps through its population. I want to highlight that evolution here is a change in allele frequency and not a change in species composition. And I think this is really worth mentioning because so much has been done on species compositions, but so little on studying evolution. And so I think it's worth just defining exactly what we're talking about here. And there's actually abundant opportunity for evolution in the human microbiome. Recent work by Sender et al. shows that there's quite a lot of bacterial cells inside of us. It's estimated that almost half of our cells inside of us are bacterial or microbial. And um, that combined with the genome size, uh, rate of replication, and rate of mutation, uh, a very nice calculation by Zhao and Lieberman shows that there's almost a billion new mutations entering our microbiomes daily. So there's quite a lot of opportunity for evolution, and yet we don't really know much about how it's acting. Now, if we pull out our population genetics textbook, we can <coughs> go through it and read chapter, ch chapter by chapter and look at main categories of processes that would be acting in a natural or any population, which would be drift and migration, recombination, and adaptation. And so that's exactly what I'm going to be talking about here today. These are, the, these are fundamental evolutionary processes that are shaping not only our genomes, but also our microbiomes. So that's the overview of my talk. And before I begin, I'm going to start with sharing with you a little bit about what microbiome data looks like before we delve into answering some of these population genetics questions. And as I mentioned, I'm going to be drawing upon some work that I've done recently with my co-authors, Benjamin Good, Katie Pollard, and Oscar Halicek, but also giving you a taste of what else is going on in the field as this is a tutorial. 
So let's first talk about the data. Also, the slides might look a little odd because I shifted everything right. <laughs> so apologies if you watch this later on and things look a little weird. Um, all right, so what kind of data do we need to study evolution in the microbiome? Well, so far, a lot of people have been studying the microbiome using 16S data. Now, what is 16S data? 16S data basically barcodes which species are present in the microbiome. It looks at a very tiny slice of its genome, and it's such a highly conserved gene that virtually every organism will have this gene, but there'll be small variations in it that can tell us which species it belongs to. However, there's a fundamental limitation with studying 16S data, and that is that we cannot sample what else is going on in the rest of the genome. So, in order to study evolution, we really need to gather the population, gen the genetic data from the rest of the genome. And to do that, a better type of data would be whole genome shotgun sequencing. And so what this is, is basically taking all the DNA in your poop, for example, and uh, fragmenting it into very tiny fragments of just about 100 base pairs or so and sequencing everything. Now this is a really complex data type. It basically is mushing together all sorts of species all together. And typically, if I were to take every uh, organism's DNA in this room and hand you a zip file and ask you to do some population genetic analysis on that, that could be actually rather challenging. But that's what we're confronted with when we deal with shotgun metagenomic data. Um, I want to highlight that indeed this is only 100 base pairs long, but there's this type of data is actually becoming uh, quite ubiquitous. But there's also uh, data that allows you to see linkage on longer length scales. Uh, potentially up uh, for the entire genome. So for example, uh, more traditional studies might look at cultured isolates, um, and that is less high throughput, but then also gives you higher resolution for longer linkage. You could also take a look at single cell and read cloud sequencing, and also metagenome assembled genomes. And I've placed a few, of the, few very recent papers for you to consult um, in particular, I want to highlight the metagenome assembled genomes because there were three great papers that just came out this year uh, that concurrently mined public metagenomic data sets to come up with uh, brand new genomes. Uh, thousands of actu actually, thousands of new genomes are added to the tree of life by looking in what is in these public data sets. And this actually greatly expanded the tree of life. So um, there's actually quite a lot of information out there um, sitting on NCBI. So for, the, for most, the majority of this talk, I'm actually going to be focusing on shotgun data, but a lot of this is applicable and can probably be done very well with uh, whole genome data as well. So um, the question is now, we have this type, this data, uh, whole genome data, and now we want, want to extract genes and SNPs from this type of data in order to be able to do some analysis. So what we can do is we can take a shotgun, sorry, we can take a reference genome approach whereby, whereby we align the reads to reference genomes, as they've done here. Um, and then we can go ahead and call SNPs site by site within each genome. And so what this does is we effectively simplify the data by binning the reads species by species. And so going ahead, we can take a look at uh, one of those species that we've aligned reads to. For example, here we're looking at the blue species, and we can see, just going site by site, that we have a very ver variable region in this, re in this part of the genome. Uh, and this person is present at 0.8%, and this person is present at 0.2%, and so on. So this allows us to look at genetic differences across hosts. And in fact, can be really useful for looking at things like strain transmissions. So for example, in, this, in the microbiome field, uh, looking at strain transmissions from moms to infants has been a very hot topic of research. And on the bottom here, I've highlighted several papers that recently came out that you might find interesting to read. So for example, if we take a look at the genetic variants that are present in mom and baby, we can see that there are some variants that are at very high frequency in mom and baby, but are absent in the broader population. And this allows us to infer that there was actually of transmission from mom to baby because those private variants were only present in that family. 
Now using this kind of analysis, what we can do is try to look and see are uh, strain transmissions common throughout the baby's first year of life. Now if we take a look only at the species level diversity, we can see that as the baby grows older, its microbiome starts to look very similar to its mom's. But as we take a look at the baby's marker sharing uh, with the mom, over time it actually decreases. So that means that although we can gain some insights from species level diversity, it doesn't really tell us the full picture. So now that we have a sense of what the data looks like in the microbiome, let's talk about some of the processes that might be shaping this genetic diversity. So let's take a look at drift and migration as one of our first forces. Now there's a very popular question in, uh, is when studying microbes, which is, is everything everywhere? Now, if we were studying elephants, it would be hard for elephants to migrate everywhere across the globe because they're big and slow moving, but bacteria are small and they can easily maybe just uh, fly somewhere else and, and, and colonize broad uh, ranges in the world. Now, to answer this question, I want to first actually zoom in and I want to look at us, not the broader population. Because if everything is everywhere, then we should actually be colonized by everything. So I want to poll you. I want to ask you what you think. Should we see exactly one strain within us for a given species, let's say E. coli? Should we see a few, like two, three, four, or five? Or should we see hundreds? Let's start with one. Who thinks it's one? One person thinks it's one. What about a few? Okay, a few more think it's few, and hundreds. Okay, so hundreds win, except that's not correct. So let's take a look at what the data says. So again, you've seen this where we are taking a look at the genetic variation site by site in, the, in a particular bacterial genome. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna draw a site frequency spectrum describing the uh, genetic variation in each host. So what is a site frequency spectrum? So basically what I've done is I've taken that species and here I've I'm working with Bacteroides vulgatus, which is a very common bacterium present in almost everybody in this room. And I'm looking at three individuals from the Human Microbiome Project. And so what I'm doing is I'm binning these allele frequencies site by site into a histogram where on the x-axis I'm ranging from zero to 50% and on the y-axis I'm looking at the fraction of sites. And so what do you see actually is a funny multimodal distribution that is unexpected in population genetics. So what can actually be going on? Well, first, I just want to point out that looking at these plots, there's actually quite a lot of variation across hosts. So let's take a look at the first individual. And actually, what you see is that there's a mode present at very low frequency and one present at almost 15%. And what's causing this mode here is actually a colonization of this host by two strains that have long diverged. And so these fixations actually manifest themselves as polymorphisms in this pooled community. And so what you have then are individuals or strains present at 15 and 85% frequency that then contribute to this peak. Now, if you're paying attention, this should actually be relatively simple to understand after this one. It's actually colonized by two strains present at fairly high frequency, roughly 50-50 frequency. This individual, however, has a far more complicated population structure, and we can't really quite tell whether this is being colonized by two, three, or four strains. So we're gonna actually ignore these kinds of samples uh, for future analyses, but I want to highlight that um, these discrete peaks indicate that we're actually oligo-colonized by a few strains. So uh, hundreds is actually not the right answer because otherwise we would actually see something more population genetics-y. We wouldn't see these discrete modes. Um, but this, uh, there are exceptions to this, and in fact there's a very nice paper I want to refer you to by Verster et al., uh, which shows that some species, and in this case it's B. fragilis, have exactly one strain colonizing us because uh, there is some competition. But the norm for the most prevalent species in our gut is that a few are colonizing us. 
So it seems that there is structure inside of us and everything is not everywhere inside of us at least. But what about across hosts? The, I, the notion that we have some structure inside of us suggests that, tr that there should actually also be structure in the broader global population. So here I actually want to show you some work by Pasoli et al, which looks at the gene composition of bacteria in different parts of the world. And they have a very nice analysis looking at non-westernized and westernized populations. And they take a look at the presence of different genes and pathways, and they see that they're actually quite distinct in these different populations. Work by Truong et al. have shown that at the SNP level, we also have biogeography. And so you can see that there are strains that are present in China that are distinct from those present in Europe and so on. And here they actually merge data from different parts of the world. But here I'm highlighting three species in which we do see biogeography. And I do want to say that this is not actually the norm. Because actually, if you take a look at some other species, such as Bacteroides vulgatus, here you actually see that the strains are present on totally different, the same, very similar strains are present on totally different continents. So what I'm plotting here is a dendrogram where on the y-axis we have divergence, and on the bottoms of this dendrogram we have uh, dots colored by the place where the sample was collected, either US in blue or China in red. And here, what you see, um, because this is plotted on a log scale, highlighted in dark uh, gray are the very closely related strains. And here, you see that there are actually very closely related strains present in China and in US, and this shows up multiple times. I'm just showing this for one species, but if we take a look at different species, we can see that um, here again I'm plotting divergence on the x-axis, um, we actually have quite a lot of closely related strains that are present uh, in different individuals. Now you might ask, is there some kind of meta variable that's driving this closely related strains present in different people? Maybe the person from China and the person from US sat together on an airplane and they exchanged a whole bunch of microbes. But actually, if we take a look at um, the no a distribution of the number of closely related strains present in in, uh, across different species uh, and we sh uh, ask, okay, for any two pairs of people, do we see one closely related strain? Do we see two closely related pairs of strains across species and three? And we shuffle the data, we actually see that the observed data reflects what we see in the null. And uh, similarly, for when we look at what's going on within and between continents, though there's a little bit of a signal suggesting that closely related strains might be more um, uh, continent specific. So uh, I just want to point out that no, I don't think we can explain this with antibiotics or travel or any other meta variable. Uh, and this is something quite interesting and intriguing to understand in the data. So is everything everywhere? No. Now let's take a look at our next question, recombination. This is a very important population genetic force, especially in sexual organisms. But what about in bacteria, which are asexual? Now there's a very, very famous paper from 1993 that I really encourage you to read by John Maynard Smith. And this paper is titled, How Clonal Are Bacteria? Now in this figure, which I really uh, find very useful, uh, John Maynard Smith uh, draws different levels of sexual bacteria. So here in A, you have completely asexual bacteria. And so drawing a tree here makes a lot of sense because uh, this is just basically a bifurcating uh, uh, tree. But um, you could also have some degree of recombination, let's say within clades, and this is what he's trying to show here with this uh, grid. And then sometimes you can have a completely uh, pervasive recombination such that it becomes almost like a panmictic population. Um, and in this case, a tree doesn't really quite make sense because you have so much recombination going on across species. Now, I'm going to give this fairly light treatment, but I just want to give you a flavor of the fact that bacteria do rec recombine uh, because there's often a common uh, perception that they do not because they reproduce asexually. And so you might ask, how exactly are they recombining? Well, there are different ways by which DNA can be uh, transmitted from a donor to a recipient, uh, including transduction, which is mediated by phages, conjugation, in which DNA is transferred via this pillus, or competence, in which uh, DNA is just taken up uh, from the environment. Now, how does it 
integrate into its own genome? Well, sometimes it may not. It might just exist as a plasmid hanging out in its environment. But sometimes you actually will see homologous recombination, just like we see in sexual organisms, where you'll have crossovers. And that can actually uh, uh, happen a number of ways in which you have homologous regions matching uh, donor and recipient. And in the process, you have um, gene gains and loss and introduction of new mutations. Um, and, and I do also want to highlight that this recombination process is not cost-free. Um, you can bring in uh, deleterious stuff, but also a lot of adaptive stuff as well. Now, there are a number of ways to detect recombination in bacterial genomes. And traditionally, people are looking at genes that might have come from one distant species to another distant species, in which case it's easy then to take a look at differences in GC content and codon usage. But I actually want to talk a little bit about recombination within a species. So how might we do that? Because in that case, you may not actually see very different codon uh, uh, signatures or GC bias. Instead, what we could do is we can draw upon linkage to equilibrium to try to detect recombination. So for example, uh, I'm going to highlight the four gamete test in which if you take a look at um, haplotypes and you ask how many combinations of alleles at these two loci do you see, uh, in this case, you see all four combinations. Now, assuming an infinite sites model, we would say that this has to have happened only by recombination. But in this case, because you have less than four gametes present, there is no recombination. Now, this kind of process can be captured using linkage disequilibrium. And in fact, in my recent paper, I, uh, uh, what we did was we computed linkage disequilibrium for this particular species, Bacteroides vulgatus. And here it is in, in blue. And I just want to note that this is actually within genes. So there's actually homologous recombination occurring within genes. And what we're doing actually is, it, this is blue in data, and we've controlled for clade structure. So without controlling for clade structure, you get uh, a very flat line up here. And we compare it actually with a null model. And what you see is that first that there is a decay uh, uh, indicating there is recombination, but it's not quite as rapid or doesn't quite follow the same shape as what we'd expect from our null. Um, <laughs> yes, please. How do you know this is not due to the independent mutations? Ah, because the question is, how do we know it's not due to independent mutations? If it were due to independent mutations, we would expect a lot of triallelic and quadallelic sites. But actually, we don't see that. The majority of the SNPs in our data are actually biallelic. Great question. And also, I want to highlight that there are other groups working on similar types of ideas, applying LD statistics to, the, uh, to bacteria. Lynn and Kusil does this with shotgun data, just like I do. Uh, Sacopardig does this with E. coli. And, and Mike Rosen et al. has written a very nice paper on quasi-sexual species. And also, to, to your question, in Sacopardnig et al., they also make the same assumption. So um, what about sequencing error? Um, so I'm not going into the bioinformatics at the moment, but it's super important. Um, and basically, we uh, are very careful about the thresholds we use for calling whether or not a SNP is present. And so right now, what we're doing is we're taking the majority allele uh, in each sample. And so these are not, um, I should clarify that this plot is being made looking at the equivalent of an isolate looked across different hosts. So this is not a plot of LD within, within us. And this is a really great question. I'm glad you clarified this. It's actually looking at LD across hosts on long time scales. If we take a look within us, we probably won't see such, such decays in LD on such short time scales. But what we do see are gene gains and losses, which are in, also indicative of recombination. Great question. OK, so now I'm going to come to the last part of this talk, which is um, going to focus largely on my own work. Uh, but I also want to highlight two very great papers that came out uh, uh, almost concurrently, uh, Zhao and Lieberman and Galliani et al. 
uh, which uh, take a look at this question in a different way. In particular, Zhao and Lieberman uh, look at a uh, uh, very impressive data set of B. fragilis from, uh, I think it was 601 isolates, um, and they were able to uh, do some very nice analysis. The difference between their work and mine is that uh, what we are doing is taking a look at public data and um, high throughput looking at a whole bunch of species all at once. Uh, and again, this is work done uh, in, in a tight collaboration with my co-first author, Benjamin Good, and also Katie Pollard and Oscar Halicek. So what we've been looking at are uh, these evolutionary dynamics within hosts. And I want to start again with the data, because that's actually fairly important uh, for understanding what I'm about to do in terms of looking for evolution within a host. So we have this uh, different types of data, 16S data and whole genome shotgun sequencing. And our challenge here is to try to identify uh, mutations that have gone from low to high frequency in this very complex data. Now, um, and, and so ideally what we'd do is we'd bin the reads species by species and then go in and take a look at frequencies that go from low to high. Now, this is not as simple as it looks because there's actually a very big complication and that is you might actually have multiple strains colonizing a host at high frequency. Now, why is this a problem? Now, I want to first take a step back and take a look at what our data again looks like. This is uh, what the Human Microbiome Project um, is all about. We have 250 hosts from North America, and these are healthy individuals. And what I'm doing is uh, I'm computing divergence for, between hosts for a particular species. So I'm looking at Bacteroides vulgatus, let's say. And if we look, on average, two different strains present in two different hosts are on average about 1% diverged. Whereas what we want to try to detect is a handful of differences that accumulate with, within us on short six-month timescales. And I'm looking at six-month timescales because that just happens to be the intervals at which the Human Microbiome Project sampled the data. So, if strains are diverged by 1%, let's think about that number. Humans and chimps are diverged by 1%. Now, uh, bear with me with this uh, analogy, but um, we wouldn't call this evolution if suddenly there was a change in frequency between humans and chimps in, the, in a population. Um, that's actually an ecological change. Instead, what we want to look for are actually genetic mutations within one of those populations uh, let's say the human population. And so this is no different. We actually care about what's going on within a strain rather than uh, the shifts in frequencies between strains. So because allele frequency changes could be driven by shifts in strains, we need to control for this. And the tricky thing is that all we're seeing are allele frequencies. So how do we do this? Going back to our site frequency spectra, we already took a look at what the lineage structure looks like and we saw that in this individual, we have a, a, a strain colonizing the host at 85% and one at 15%. Now, our, our goal here actually is to try to resolve uh, or phase the genotype of the dominant strain so that we can track evolution on its background. So, uh, and again, we're going to ignore these very complex uh, samples because it's very difficult to actually determine exactly what the lineage structure is and no less phase it. So, okay, I moved everything over, so things are gonna look a little weird. But here, uh, let's take a look at two sites in this particular uh, person's microbiome. Um, if we take a look, we'll expect uh, for any particular site, an allele to be present at 85% and one at 15%. Now, it's easy to see that you can basically assign the dominant allele to the dominant strain. Now this sample, however, is uh, not easy to work with because there's an equal probability of assigning the wrong allele to the wrong strain. So these kinds of samples in which you have two dominant strains is not a great sample to look at. And instead, what we're going to do is focus on those samples that have a very clear lineage structure that's simple and easy to quasi-phase. And I say quasi-phase because in this case, we're actually able to confidently assign pairs of alleles to a single haplotype background rather than the entire uh, set of alleles. So once we do that, we can then go in and take a look at allele frequencies that go from low to high. 
And uh, this is exactly the kind of signal that I'm looking for when I'm looking for uh, uh, evolution within a host. And also I'm looking for low to high because I want to avoid uh, errors like sampling errors. Now, uh, if we want to condition our analysis on these special types of samples, you might ask, well, how many samples exactly do we have? And so uh, taking a look at the top 30 most prevalent species in our data, colored in dark blue are those special quasi-phaseable samples. And actually, uh, looking at the uh, across hosts and species combinations, we have 801 resident populations to work with, which is quite a lot of data to work with uh, and, and to do population genetics with simultaneously. So from here onwards, I'm actually going to pool the data across species and hosts to try to come up with some general uh, insights about evolutionary dynamics in the host because for any given species or host we might not have a ton of data to make uh, um, uh, very precise inferences. So again, here what we're about to do is take a look at alleles that, allele frequencies that go from low to high over the six month time span. And um, what I'm about to do is plot fraction uh, um, a survival distribution describing the number of changes that are occurring inside of a host in our 801 resident populations. Now, I know that this is cut off on the y-axis, and what it says is fraction of comparisons greater than n. And so basically, on the y-axis, I'm asking how many uh, of our resident populations have n or more SNP changes. So for example, if I draw, well, here's what the data looks like. If I draw a line here, what I'm saying is that about 10% have about uh, uh, one or, or five or more SNP changes uh, or more. So okay, let's try to dissect this plot. First, because this is plotted on a log scale, we have to note that there's actually a zero bin. And here, 88% uh, of our resident populations show zero changes with our machinery. Now this is not news. But what is news, given our method, is that 9% uh, actually show a few changes on the order of 5 to 10 SNP changes. And then 3% show a lot of changes on the order of about 10,000. So what's going on? This is a weird bimodal distribution, and there might be actually two processes that are generating these patterns. So let's take a look and see what's going on. Remember our hypotheses. Perhaps what's going on is that we're seeing invasions and evolution being mixed together. So to distinguish this, let's think about what we'd expect for an invasion versus an evolution. So going back to our human microbiome project data, remember we have a subset of hosts that uh, are sampled um, across the US. Uh, in two cities, and then we also have some of them that are sampled over time. Now what we're looking for are those handful of differences that accumulate over time. Whereas an invasion, what you would see are quite a lot of differences that accumulate over these longer branches. And so if we take a look and we actually compute the average number of SNP differences that are occurring within a host over time versus between hosts, you actually see quite a difference in order of magnitude. Within hosts, it's on the order of about 100, and between hosts, it's on the order of about 10,000. Now, within hosts, this is probably mixing up evolution and invasions. So let's take a look then, and let's now draw another line describing the number of SNP differences that are occurring between hosts. And here it is. Basically, almost every single a uh, pair of hosts has so many SNP differences uh, that it's almost everybody has about 10,000 10, or more. So using this between host SNP differences, we can use that as a control for what's going on within hosts. And we can classify what's going on within hosts as evolution on the left side of this plot and invasions on the right side of this plot. So that means that indeed evolution is happening inside of us. Now, what about over our lifetime? Now, the ideal data for this is actually pretty hard to get. We would have to track a person uh, for uh, 
a long time and see whether the same bacteria are present uh, uh, 20 years from now. But still, it's a very interesting question. If the bacteria are evolving inside of us, do they keep evolving or do they get replaced? So here, we have a small subset that gets replaced. Maybe there's some constant rate at which these bacteria get replaced. And so one question we could ask is, does every strain get replaced after 20 years? Or are there some hosts that are ex extra susceptible, maybe due to antibiotics or because they traveled and had diarrhea or something like that? Or maybe some strains become so well adapted to their hosts that replacements become less and less likely with age. So again, I want to poll you and ask you which ones you think are, is, is going to happen. Who thinks that every strain will get replaced after 20 years? Raise your hand. Okay, about five people. Who thinks that it's just a few hosts that are extremely susceptible because they had antibiotics? Some more. Okay, and who thinks that strains become so well adapted that, they, that replacements become very unlikely after time. Okay, that's, that's what the majority of you think. Um, so let's, let's try to answer this. So again, the ideal data is to take a look at longitudinal samples over a few decades. But as you may have realized that this is actually very difficult to do. So instead, what we're going to do is we're actually going to leverage uh, data from twins to test for long-term dynamics. So there was a paper by Corpella et al, which showed that cohabiting teenage twins and siblings share many strains. And so it turns out that there was actually a really nice data set by Xi et al, which, looked at, which had uh, sequenced 125 adult twin pairs from the UK. And, um, and, and uh, uh, these twins have lived apart for 40 years after growing up in the same household. So the question that, I, that we asked was, do adult twins share the same strains? If they do, then we can say that they are becoming more and more well adapted to us and, they, and they're unlikely to be replaced. But if they don't, then we can say that replacements are common. So going back to this plot, I'm now going to add another line to this, looking at the number of SNP differences occurring between twins. And here it is. It's actually very similar to what's going on between hosts. So on average, every twin pair has about uh, uh, the same number of SNP differences as what's going on between hosts, about 10,000 or more. This is too many SNP differences to have accumulated within uh, even just a, even on 40 year timescales. And so what we can conclude is that replacements dominate over our time, even though evolution seems to be happening on short timescales. So I've gone through many different of population genetic processes in this talk. I've shared with you what the data looks like, a little bit about drift and migration uh, within and across hosts, recombination, um, and also what evolution inside of a host might look like. I want to just sum up and share with you some highlights. We have a lot of data. We have a lot of population structure, but a lot of mysteries also in that population structure. Why do we see very similar strains on totally different continents? Why do we see oligocolonization inside of us? We also see a lot of recombination in many species. And I know that I just showed you one example from one species, but many of these papers are starting to show that bacteria can be quasi-sexual. Um, on six months short time scales, bacteria can evolve in the human microbiome. And this is really exciting because it means that species fluctuations are not the only way by which bacteria, by which our microbiomes are responding to environmental changes. Evolution could be playing a big role. However, we still are yet to learn how that evolution intersects with ecology um, and how it shapes those species dynamics and vice versa. Over our lifetimes, bacteria are replaced. And this suggests that there are fundamental limits to how well adapted bacteria become to us. Why do they get replaced? We don't know. Could it be happening in bursts due to antibiotics? Could it be happening gradually? These are open questions to be answered in the future. I want to share that I'm recruiting students and postdocs 
If you're interested to join my lab or just chat about population genetics in the microbiome, please contact me. And I've just finished writing a review on population genetics in the microbiome. Um, if you would like to read it before it comes out, I'd be happy to email it to you. I'd like to thank Benjamin Good, Katie Pollard, and Oscar Halachek, my co-authors on uh, our recent paper on the evolutionary dynamics of gut bacteria. I encourage you to check it out, and I'd be very happy to take questions.